Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. We will give some minutes to people to join in this and then we're going to start. So while we are uh, waiting for people to join in, I'd like to give you some information. So this webinar will be presented in English, but you can listen to the translations to Portuguese and Spanish. So if you'd like to hear in Portuguese or in Spanish, you would need to click in the global icon in the bottom of the screen and select Portuguese or English channel, or, sorry, Portuguese or Spanish channel, the language we you would like to hear. Thank you. So we're going to start in a few minutes. While we are waiting for people to join, would like to ask you to present yourself, to introduce yourself in the chat. Please tell us your name, the company you're working for in the your role, and we'd love to hear from you. So before starting, again, a few more information for you. This webinar is going to be presented in English, but we have simultaneous translations to Portuguese and Spanish. To select the language you'd like to hear, you need to, cl to click in the icon, the globe icon in the bottom of your screen to select the language, Portuguese or Spanish. Uh, and then you can hear the simultaneous translations. Also, as I said, before, please introduce yourself in the chat, say your name, the company you're working for, your role, uh, and you're going to start uh, the webinar soon. So just to clarify, this webinar focused on the change zone, the Nsuku ERED standard. So the first part of this webinar will be the presentation, uh, talking about the change, and in the last part, you're going to have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions at any time, please use the Q&A function in the button of your screen to write down your questions. Uh, please don't do that on the chat, do in the Q&A session. So welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Paula. I'm standard, standards manager in the Sucro, and today I'm here with my colleague Carla Duron, assurance manager. And also, with our consultant, Arian. Hi, Arian. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, so I'd like to, before I hand over to Arian, just to let you know about your questions. If you have any questions, again, use the Q&A function. You can write this down in Portuguese, Spanish, or English, whatever you feel more comfortable. So thank you so much for joining. And Arian, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paula, and thanks for your introduction. Um, yes, again, hello, everybody. It's um, my pleasure today to speak to you about the Bonsuko ERED standard version 2.1, and in particular to give you an overview of the key changes in that standard compared to the previous version of that standard. But before going there, maybe just a couple of words about myself. Um, I work as a consultant, primarily in the area of sustainable resources management, certification and waste management. I'm from the Netherlands. And I've had the pleasure to uh, assist Bon Sucro 
over the past few years in uh, drafting the Bonsucro ERAT standard, this version and also a previous version of, uh, of that standard. Um, before going to the actual changes that have occurred in the um, current version of the Bonsucro ERAT standard, it's probably useful to um, reiterate a bit on the objective and the history of the Bonsucor ERAT standard. The background of the Bonsucor ERAT standard is an EU legislation, is an European legislation. The EU has uh, laid down uh, objectives, targets for renewable energy. And it has specified that energy from uh, derived from biofuels, from bioliquids and biomass fuels can only be counted as being renewable if those fuels meet certain sustainability requirements, or if the biomass rather from which those fuels has been produced meets certain sustainability requirements. Well, those sustainability requirements, they have been specified by the European Commission in a piece of legislation which is called the EU Renewable Energy Directive, also referred to as REV or RED. And in that uh, Renewable Energy Directive, it also says that um, economic operators who place biofuels, bioliquids, biomass fuels on the market, they can use voluntary schemes, they can use certification schemes to show that they comply with the sustainability requirements of the legislation. Well, one of the certification schemes that can be used to show compliance with European sustainability requirements for biofuels derived from sugarcane is the Bonsucro ERAT standard. The Bonsucro ERAT standard has a bit of a history. In 2009, when the first European Renewable Energy Directive was published by the European Commission in Europe, uh, Bonsucro um, decided to include the European sustainability requirements in its uh, production standard and in its CHOC standard. When then in 2018, the European Commission published a revised version of the Renewable Energy Directive, the RED2, Bonsucro decided to develop a separate standard to include specifically the European sustainability requirements. And that then became the Bonsucro ERAD standard version one. More recently, in 2022, the European Commission published an implementing regulation, which is a bit of uh, basically uh, additional legislation uh, to further specify the requirements which have been laid down in the EU Renewable Energy Directive in 2018. And voluntary schemes, voluntary certification schemes such as Bonsucro EU Red, then uh, had, to, had to be amended to include the additional sustainability requirements from the implementing regulation in their scheme documentation. That's what Bonsucro uh, did over the past year or so, and that uh, process has led to a new version of the Bonsucro ERAD standard, which is the version 2.1, which has meanwhile also been approved by the European Commission for use as a voluntary scheme. It's also good to take note of the following, which is that um, last year, again, the European uh, Union um, uh, accepted, uh, agreed on a new version of the Renewable Energy Directives, which is the Renewable Energy Directive number three. Um, in that Renewable Energy Directive uh, three, there is uh, again new sustainability requirements for bioliquids, uh, biofuels, and biomass fuels. And at some point in time, those additional requirements will need to be incorporated in the, vol in the voluntary certification scheme. So also at some point, Bonsucro will have to include those additional requirements in its Bonsucro ERAD standard. 
at the moment, we do not know uh, how this process uh, is envisaged by the European Commission. We also do not know the timeline. Um, so really, for the time being and for the foreseeable future also, on Sucro, the red standard version 2.1 is the version to work with. So today, the objective of, of the webinar today is to present to you an overview of the changes in the Bonsuko for EWAT standard version 2.1 compared with the previous version 1.1, and which are, as I explained, the changes which follow from this European implementing regulation 2022-996. So in the in the in the in the webinar, I will go through uh, this this long list of items. Um, many of which uh, relate to changes in the actual uh, Monsucro ERAD standard. I'll talk a bit about the scope of the standard, then about changes in the requirements for mills and the supply chain, respectively, and greenhouse gas calculations, then a change in relation to the acceptance of other certificates by Monsucro, consequences of all these changes for the Monsucro calculator, and then I will uh, briefly touch upon that today, since this, uh, since we have a specific webinars this week for certification bodies. Uh, also, I will touch uh, relatively briefly on changes and requirements for certification bodies, then a bit on, ch on changes and requirements for Bonsucro, and some final remarks. I have to say that although this is a lot of content which I'm going to discuss, still, it's not the full changes which I'm going to uh, going to explain simply because time of this webinar doesn't allow to go through all the changes in all detail. So the focus will be on the number of key changes. Not all details will be discussed today. So it's always necessary to check the standard version 2.1 as reference document. So do, do not please do not rely solely on the information provided during the webinar today or on the slides uh, presented today. Always uh, read those in conjunction with the actual standard version 2.1. So then, on the um, scope of the Bonsucro ERED standard. Well, I'm happy to say that the scope of the Bonsucro ERED standard hasn't changed. It hasn't changed going from version 1 to version uh, 2.1. The Bonsucro ERAD standard covers cultivation and processing of sugarcane to produce biofuels, bioliquids, and biomaterials for use in the EU, so for compliance EU sustainability requirements. It covers uh, various uh, chains, so production of first generation ethanol either by fermentation of sugarcane juice or by fermentation of molasses. Then it covers second generation ethanol produced from the gas and solid biomass fuels. So that's the fuels basically used to produce electricity and or heat and cooling uh, from the gas. Agricult agricultural residues from sugar cane cultivation are not in the scope. And also processing waste and processing residues are not in the scope of the with the exception of the gas which is included in the scope. I'm not, I will get back to my guess a bit later in this presentation. Um, changes in the requirements for mills. Um, <clears throat> what is listed in, on this slide are the indicators um, in the Bonsuko ERED standard, which um, uh, comprise specific requirements for mills. So indicator EU 1.1 up to indicator EU 4.1. Most of these indicators have not changed in the new version of the Bonsuko ERAD standards. There's two indicators where some changes have occurred, which is indicator 1.1 on the greenhouse gas criterion. I will not deal with those changes uh, now. I'll do that a bit later in conjunction with the changes in the greenhouse gas criterion for the supply chain. Um, and then there is, there is ch uh, changes in the requirements uh, uh, in indicator 2.4, which is on highly biodiverse grassland. 
as most of you probably know, an indicator on highly biodiverse grassland was already included in the uh, previous uh, version of the standard. And um, that uh, requirement reads that, well, biofuels, uh, biliquids, biomass fuels from agricultural biomass shall not be made from raw material obtained from land that was highly biodiverse grassland in or after January 2008 whereby then in the um, uh, uh, in the standard highly biodiverse grassland is defined as either natural with a definition or non-natural. So in other words, both natural grassland can be highly biodiverse if it meets certain requirements and also non-natural grassland can be highly biodiverse if it meets certain requirements. Well, this was already in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the standard. Um, what is um, uh, new in the new version of the standard is what has been highlighted in the green box on this uh, on this slide, and that is a further clarification of when natural grassland qualifies as being highly biodiverse. But further guidance, further explanation of how this definition of highly biodiverse grassland applied to natural grassland should be uh, read and should be applied. I'm not going to um, uh, spell this green box out in, in detail, but if, if you're dealing with, with grassland and grassland assessment, please um, uh, study this, uh, this part uh, carefully. Uh, the second uh, element where there is a bit further guidance in the new version of the standard is in relation to the question, when is non-natural grassland highly biodiverse? Um, what I've tried to do on this slide is that I have um, put um, uh, the, 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 the various uh, criteria in, in green, uh, which need to be applied with in order to qualify or to classify rather uh, non-natural grassland as highly biodiverse. I try to to set that in a simple sort of a decision tree on this slide, and without going through it in all detail now, what you hopefully can see is that in order for non-natural grassland to qualify as highly biodiverse, a number of requirements and requirements must be met, and if one or more of these requirements are not met, then the grassland qualifies as um, uh, it does not qualify as highly biodiverse. Um, so that's so there is, as I mentioned, um, further guidance clarification both on when natural grassland shall be considered highly biodiverse and when non-natural grassland shall be highly shall be considered highly biodiverse. Also, in the new version of the uh, standard. There is more um, guidance on the expertise which uh, shall be involved when assessments of uh, the biodiversity status of grasslands are carried out. Um, in section 6.71 of the new Consecrated Red Standard, um, qualifications for the experts which um, shall undertake the assessment of grasslands have been specified. So this expert must be included in the audit team, can be part of the, uh, can be, can be a, 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 an employee of the certification body or an external uh, expert. That doesn't matter. What is important is that this expert is um, independent from uh, uh, the, the mill or the operator otherwise, which is being, uh, which is being audited. And in addition, meets a number of very specific um, uh, professional qualification, which, as I said, have been specified in this uh, section 6.7.1. This expert shall be involved in the assessment of the grasslands, shall establish on a case-by-case -case basis whether a piece of land is or was, in case of conversion, highly biodiverse grassland. And what, all, what is also important is that this assessment doesn't have to be done annually. Once the status of the grassland has been uh, determined, um, or what the status was before conversion, then that evidence is sufficient and doesn't have to be uh, repeated on an, 
during an annual uh, during an annual uh, audit. So then on changes and requirements for the supply chain. Um, in the Consumer e red standard, there's two sets of um, additional e red requirements for the supply chain. This is the first set, which is indicator 5.1 up to and including indicator 5.7, which is about general mass balance requirements. Well, as you can see, in most of these indicators, there's no changes in the new version of the Bonsucre ERAT standard. Only in indicator 5.3, there is a change. Um, indicator 5.3 is about uh, record keeping, so that uh, economic operators, they have to keep records, keep administration of the incoming supplies, outgoing supplies, data, and sustainability information attached to that, et cetera, et cetera. That was already in the previous version of the standard. What is new is that uh, to indicator 5.3, this uh, requirement has been added, which says that economic operators shall enter requested information in the union database. The union database is a traceability tool created and also by the, by the European Commission and also uh, operated ultimately by the European Commission or at least by co a company on behalf of the European Commission. Um, the uh, UDB has been accessible for registered economic operators from January this year onwards. Um, but same time the UDB hasn't been finalized yet it's still being um, uh, uh, finalized and that means that currently the use of the UDB is not a requirement for operators in other words this requirement does currently not yet apply however it is expected that the UDB will be fully operational and will be obligatory so for all economic operators for all supply chain operators sometime towards the end of this year. And obviously when that's the case, on Sucro will communicate that to its members and to certification bodies separately. This is the second uh, set of additional uh, Bonsucro ERAT requirements for the supply chain which is about validating and reconciling uh, Bonsucro EU RED data. Also, this set of indicators was already in the previous version of the standard, for the, except for indicator 6.11. And what you can see is that, um, well, indicator 6.4, 6.9, and 6.11 have changed in the new version of the standard. Indicator 6.4 is about the mixing of Bon Sucro certified products with products which are fungible with sugar cane derived products. Well, the, the change to this indicator is that um, is, is what has been highlighted here in the, in, the, in, in the green box, and that is that a definition has been provided now what are fungible products. And as you can read here, fungible products are products which belong to the same product group as sugarcane derived products, meaning that they have the same physical or chemical characteristics, heating values, and conversion factors. And then, as an example, ethanol from corn is fungible with ethanol from sugarcane, as these products have the same characteristics and can be mixed without losing their original characteristics. Well, why is this? definition of fungible um, uh, so important that's on the first part of the slide um, that is because if there is a batch of monsucro e-red e certified products which is be for example ethanol monsucro e-red certified ethanol and that's physically mixed with a fungible product so say corn um, derived uh, ethanol um, then the uh, and, and that's mixed and then batches of material are being taken from that mix then the bonsucro e red data 
which have, were attached to the material going into the mix may be allocated to any physical batch taken from that batch. In other words, it doesn't matter if the output uh, of the, the, the batch taken from the mix, whether that's corn uh, derived ethanol, whether it's one super ethanol, or whether you don't know what exactly it is, since it has been mixed, of course, the Bonsucro e red data going into the mix can be attached to any batch taken from the mix. Of course, provided that the input and the output of the Bonsucro e red data match, so that no overclaiming of Bonsucro e red data. The second um, indicator which has been uh, uh, changed in this whole set of uh, indicators related to attributing sustainability characteristics is um, related to uh, mass balance rules. What the implementing uh, regulation uh, does is that it, is that it uh, details a number of mass balance rules uh, further than was previously the case. It's not necessarily that there is completely new rules. It's particularly that the, the rules have been specified further, in particular in relation to attributing sustainability characteristics. Um, there's a various changes, and uh, these changes are detailed. What we have done in the bon new version of the Bonsucro e red standard is that we have included a number of practical examples, mass balance examples, basically to illustrate how the rules shall be applied. Well, uh, time doesn't allow me um, uh, during this uh, webinar to go through all those detail, uh, through all these examples in, in, in detail. But what I'd like to do is to um, highlight uh, one of the examples which has been included in the standard. And that's this example, which has been um, uh, which is related to um, the, uh, the the fact that uh, su sustainability uh, data and greenhouse gas data uh, shall be considered uh, uh, as a set. What you see in this example here is on the left uh, side, there's two batches of material going into a, a mix. Two batches of uh, bon sucro uh, E-RED certified ethanol, 200 tons, is batch two and 100 ton is batch one. But both of these batches have uh, different sustainability characteristics. Batch two has a greenhouse gas intensity of 16 and its country of origin is Argentina. Whereas batch one, the sustainability characteristics of batch one is that it has a greenhouse gas intensity of 12 and the country of origin is Brazil. Well, those two batches go into this mix, and from that mix, then three batches are taken. What is important now that for any batch which is taken from that mix, the uh, the existing sets of sustainability characteristics are not being split. So, in other words, that the greenhouse gas intensity of sixteen and the country of origin, Argentina, which is a set that those sustainability characteristics always remain together, so to say. And the same applies for the greenhouse gas intensity of 12 in the country of origin of Brazil, that those, that, that set of sustainability characteristics always remain together. And you can see that that has happened in the three batches. So here in batch three, so there's 100 ton, which is related to the sustainability characteristics of batch two, exactly the same as the case for batch four, which has exactly the same sustainability characteristics as batch two. And then for batch five, it has the same sustainability characteristics as batch one. So this is really how the rule shall be applied. This shows an example of how the rule shall not be applied. Same example, again, three batches taken from, uh, from the mix uh, of batch one and two. But what you see here is that although in batch three has the same sustainability characteristics as batch two, so that's fine. So the set of sustainability characteristics has remained intact. But what you find for batch four here is that batch four now contains a 
and set of sustainability characteristics, which is yeah, a, a mixture of uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas intensity of batch two and the country of origin of batch one. And that is not allowed. So it means that those two sets of sustainability characteristics for batch two and batch one, those have been split. And that's not allowed. And same has been done here in batch five. But I also find that the uh, that the greenhouse gas intensity of batch one has been combined with the country of origin of batch two. So in other words, also here, the original sets of sustainability characteristics of batch one and of batch two have been mixed, so have been split, and that is not allowed. Well, this is, this is, as I said, one of the examples which has been uh, included in the, uh, in the um, um, Monsukor e red standard. Um, and I strongly recommend you to, um, to, to, uh, to study these, uh, these various examples in, 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 in detail. I think it's probably the best way uh, to get to grips of what these exact uh, detailed mass balance rules uh, imply in, in practice. Well, then the third um, indicator, um, which, um, which, which has been changed a lot, have been added to this whole set of uh, indicators under uh, six, is indicator 6.11. And that indicator um, uh, refers to corporate co-processing, whereby co-processing is defined as a process whereby an oil refinery unit processes biomass feedstock together with fossil feedstocks and then transforms it into final fuels. What is obviously important then is how to determine which part of the produced final fuels can be considered as being biofuels, as biofuels meeting the relevant sustainability requirements. Well, rules to do so have been specified in a delegated act, which is the number is, is mentioned here. And the delegated act says that the uh, determination of the share of biofuels um, can be done on the basis of energy, mass, or yield. What is also important, and you will also read that in the Bonsukur EU Red Standard, is that the requirements for this co-processing, so for the attributing of uh, sustainability characteristics in case of co-processing, have not yet been finalized by the European Commission. Um, as soon as uh, those requirements for co-processing have been finalized and guidance is clear, then Bonsukro will obviously provide further guidance specifically for this indicator 6.11. Then, changes in greenhouse gas calculations. Changes in greenhouse gas calculations obviously apply both to mills and to supply chain uh, operators. First, in relation to greenhouse gas default values. Well, the good news here is that the default values for bioethanol from sugarcane have not changed, have not been changed in the new version of the, uh, of the standard. Um, they have been listed here. What is important to uh, realize that uh, one of the chains which is covered, the uh, production uh, pathways, I must say, which is covered by the Bonsukur EU Red standard, namely the production of second generation bioethanol from by gas, for that production pathway, no default values are available, have been made available by the European Commission, which means obviously that default values cannot be used. And in the case, um, that pathway is applicable, then actual greenhouse gas calculations must be applied. Um, also, for biomass fuels being uh, bagasse briquettes, so briquettes produced from bagasse, the default values have not been changed in the new version of the standard. Um, there is though a couple of um, points I like to highlight with this uh, table on this slide. 
first of all, you see that uh, the um, emission factor, the disaggregated default value for cultivation here is zero. The reason uh, for that is that under um, EU requirements, under uh, RED legislation, the gas is being considered a processing residue. It's not an agricultural residue, it's considered to be a processing residue. And uh, for that reason, no emissions related to uh, uh, cultivation cell shall be accounted towards uh, by gas. The second thing is that you see that there is, uh, from a gas, that there is two different um, disaggregated default values for transport and distribution. One if the transport distance is between 500 and 10,000 k kilometers, and one if the transport distance, the total transport distance, is over 10,000 kilometers. Um, and the consequence of those two disaggregated default values for transport and distribution also is that there is two different total default values for biomass fuels uh, being the gas briquettes, which are um, uh, listed on this uh, on this um, on, in this table. The final point which I'd like to highlight, um, I mean, if you summarize the disaggregated default values listed in this table, you will find that the uh, total default value is slightly different. So it seems that uh, the total default values listed here have been rounded off to whole figures. Um, so it's not an exact uh, sum of the disaggregated default values. Um, I don't know, to be honest, what's the reason uh, for this. What is important is that these are the exact default values which have been listed in the um, in the annexes of the Renewable Energy Directive, and these are the uh, default values that shall be used, but just so that you are aware. Um, then about um, changes in actual greenhouse gas calculations. Um, again, the good news is that the overall methodology to calculate actual greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas saving has not changed in the new version of the study. However, there is two elements where more details are provided on how calculations shall be carried out. The first one is related to the calculations of two specific emission factors, namely the emissions from cultivation and the emission savings from uh, uh, improved uh, carbon storage in soils, ESCA. And the second element is that uh, which has been changed is that um, is on the data that shall be used uh, for doing the calculations. And I'll explain both aspects a bit further now. First, on the calculations of the two specific greenhouse gas emission factors. The new version of the Bonsucre EU Red Standard contains a new Annex 2. That new Annex 2 contains the methodology for determining the emissions from the cultivation of sugarcane. This is new and in, in uh, Bonsucre has developed this new Annex in response to, uh, well, obviously the requirements from the implementing regulation in the implementing regulation, there's much more specific requirements on how emissions from cultivation shall be uh, shall be done. So those um, requirements have been included in this Annex 2. And when actual calculations are being used and cultivation emissions shall be calculated, Annex 2 methodology shall be followed. Then there is also a new Annex 3 in the Bonsucro uh, year red standard, and that one is the methodology for determining the emission savings from soil carbon accumulation via improved agricultural management. So in case an operator uses actual greenhouse gas 
uh, calculations, and, and Mill in particular ambitious to um, uh, calculate ESCA, greenhouse gas emission savings from soil carbon accumulation, then the methodology in Annex 3 shall be followed. The other aspect which has changed in relation to actual greenhouse gas calculation is about the greenhouse gas data, so to say that the emission factors, the background data that can be used for the calculation. Um, the new version of the uh, bon sucre e red standard uh, is much more strict in which data, which emission factors can be used for the calculation. And that's, of course, again, following the requirements from the implementing regulation. If you look into the implementing regulation 2022-996 in Annex 9, you will find a long list of standard emission factors. Emission factors, for example, for the production of electricity, for the production of all types of fertilizers and pesticides, for transport, for diesel use, etc. What the new standard says that in greenhouse gas, in actual greenhouse gas calculations, the emission factors of Annex 9 of the implementing regulation shall be used as far as available in that Annex. And only if Annex 9 does not provide the emission factor which you're looking for, then you may use emission factors taken, uh, you may use emission factors from other um, uh, scientifically recognized databases, for example, the eco invent database, or from scientific literature sources. So it's not forbidden to use um, emission factors from scientific literature or from scientifically recognized databases. You can only use those if there is no emission factor um, provided in Annex 9 of the implementing regulation. Then, an important new element in the new version of the Bonsucro ERET standard, which is about the acceptance of other voluntary schemes. In the new version of the um, standard, it says that Bonsucro accepts claims from all voluntary schemes that are recognized by the European Commission, where these schemes are used for sugarcane and sugarcane derived products. This is not necessarily um, something which uh, Bonsucro wanted to include in its standard but it's something which the European Commission required all voluntary schemes to include in their standards. The European Commission requires that voluntary schemes, which which it approves, recognize each other's claims. Um, Practically, that means that if a Bon Sucro ERET certified operator accepts sugarcane or sugarcane derived products which have not been certified against Bon Sucro ERET but which have been certified against another EU recognized scheme, say for example ICC EU, then that material shall also be considered as being compliant with the EU red sustainability requirements. Well, Bon Sucro decided that um, it's uh, that a separate um, claim shall be used for those materials. So a separate claim shall be used for sugarcane and sugarcane derived products, which have been certified against another EU EU-approved certification scheme. And that claim uh, for those materials shall be EU-RED compliant. So in other words, all incoming deliveries and outgoing deliveries of 
sugarcane and sugarcane derived products, which have been certified against another EC recognized scheme, shall be registered as EU RED compliant. And for those material, the claim Bon Sucre EU RED certified is not allowed. So the claim Bon Sucre EU RED certified is only allowed for material which has been certif certified against the Bon Sucre EU RED standard. And all documentation, invoices, transport documentation shall clearly indicate the claim. So no bon sucro claims, logos, etc., shall be used for deliveries that are EU RAT compliant, it shall be distinguished. So this difference between bon sucro EU RAT certified and EU RAT compliant probably pretty straightforward if there was only uh, material going in and going out. However, it might become a bit more complicated in case of processing of um, different feedstocks with potentially different uh, claims attached to it. So that's why I um, wanted to explain that a bit further. And um, by way of a very simple example, um, this is it here, an example where a bagasse briquette is uh, being made, is being produced, using sugarcane derived molasses as a binding material. So very simple, so there's a process, so to say with two ingredients, it's bagasse and it's uh, molasses from sugarcane, which are together formed into a briquette. Well, what um, can, what can, uh, what can the situations be in that, in that case? Uh, let me find the pointer here. Yeah. So the first case, say if the bagasse going into the process is the Bon Sucre EUET certified and also the molasse binder is Bon Sucre EUET certified. In that case, 100% of the inputs are Bon Sucre EUET certified, meaning that the briquette, the output of the process, can also carry the claim on Sucro EU RAT certified. However, say that uh, the bagasse going into the process is on Sucro EU RAT certified, and the molasse binder is not on Sucro EU RAT certified, but it has been certified against another EC approved certification scheme. So, for example, against ICC EU. In that case, it is important what the mass percentages of both ingredients to the process are. Um, bon Sucre allows a claim of Bon Sucre ERAT certified for the outgoing product if at least 95 mass percent of the ingoing, uh, 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 ingoing materials of the ingredients in the process, so to say, carries a claim Bon Sucre EU RAT certified. So in this second example here, the bagasse is just by way of example, 96 mass percent of the inputs and the molasse binder, which is not Bon Sucre EU RAT certified is four mass percent. So this means that of the overall input to the process, more than 95% is Bon Sucre EU RAT certified so that the output the claim Bon Sucre EU RAT certified can be attached to the briquette, to the output of the process. In the third example here, this is different. In the third example here, you see that um, the, the bagasse is 90% of the input and the molasse by 10 mass percent of the input, meaning that overall only 90% of the input to the process is Bon Sucre EU RAT certified. Well, that um, uh, ten, uh, the, the other ten percent still is being uh, certified against an EU approved certification scheme. So the one hundred percent overall is certified against an uh, EC approved certification scheme, which means that the outputs, the briquette, can carry the claim EU RAT compliant, but it cannot 
carry the claim on Sucro E red certified. If, of course, one of the two in, in this example, let's say the molas binder wouldn't be um, certified at all, wouldn't have been certified against any certification scheme, then no claim can be attached to the output of the uh, uh, process, not the Bonsuko ERAT certified claim and not the ERAT compliant claim. Um, in this decision three, which is uh, slightly more complicated than the previous slide, I've again tried to to uh, list sort of the the, the, the the various options and and, and the claims uh, related when um, different uh, inputs with different uh, claims are being processed together. So here you find the first question, the first relevant question is, are all the inputs to the process sugarcane derived? Well, if that's not the case, then the claims, the, the, the Bonsuko e red claims are not applicable at all because we're talking about other types of biomass. So no claim, Bonsuko e red or e red compliant can be attached to the output. However, if all the inputs to the process are sugarcane derived, then the next question is, are all the inputs to the process Bonsuko e red certified? Well, we saw that example in the, uh, in the, on the previous slide, there, the first example whereby both the bagasse and the molasse were Bonsuko e red certified. If that's the case, the answer is simple. Yes, the output can be Bonsuko e red certified. If not all the inputs to the process are Bonsuko e red certified, then the follow up question is, is then at least more than 95% mass percent of all the inputs to the process Bonsuko e red certified? And as I mentioned um, uh, on the previous slide, if more than 95% of all the inputs is Monsuko ERET certified, then Monsuko allows to attach the claim Monsuko ERET certified also to the output. So if the answer is yes, yes, then the claim Monsuko ERET certified can be attached to the output. However, is not more than 95% of all the inputs Bonsuko e red certified, so less than 95%, then the follow-up question is, are then at least all the inputs certified against an EC recognized certification scheme against another certification scheme? If the answer to that question is no, so if there is inputs which are not certified at all against any certification scheme, then of course no claim can be made to the output. However, if all the inputs have been certified against an EU recognized certification scheme, then yes, the output can be claimed to be EU RAD compliant. So not on Sucor EU RAD certified, but it can be claimed to be EU RAD compliant. So I hope this. Um, uh, clarifies the different options and the different claims and when they can and cannot be attached um, a bit a bit uh, further. Then, coming to the uh, consequences for the Bonsucro calculator. Well, um, the changes in the um, new version of the Bonsucro ERET standard um, do not have uh, direct consequences for the Bonsucro uh, calculator. Uh, well, let's say not for the use of the Bonsucro calculator. The current version of the Bonsucro calculator, version 5.2.2, can still uh, be used and remain to be used for the different uh, purposes mentioned here. So for the default values, uh, uh, for uh, required greenhouse gas savings, uh, land use change emission, and also for entering final results of actual greenhouse gas calculations. I have to say the calculator is currently under revision. That revision will include some minor changes, uh, which are the result of, of changes in the Bonsuko e red standard, as discussed today. And, um, so there will be uh, an, a next version of the uh, calculator available in, in due course where all these 
let's say, relatively minor changes have been uh, included. And Bonsucor will inform you when that's um, uh, when, when the new version is available and when the, uh, the current version 5.2.2 can no longer be used. But for the time being, version 5.2.2 can still be used. Then, yeah, there is um, changes in requirements for certification bodies and uh, requirements for audits. Um, here you see there is a there's a whole list of of changes in requirements for certification bodies and for auditors. In the uh, webinars uh, this week for the uh, certification bodies, we go through these uh, changes in a um, good bit of, of detail, since of course these changes are particularly important for them. Um, today I'll just go uh, through those um, uh, changes uh, very briefly and highlight just one or two which are of particular importance also for um, operators realize. Well, first there is changes on uh, competencies for auditors. Um, for the definition of what independent and free from conflict of interest mean, particularly imp important for certification bodies, but less important for economic operators. So I'll leave that for what it is. So if you are interested, you can read all details, of course, in chapter six of the standard. Um, yeah, then there is, this might be, might be of relevance to know for you too, is that um, the certification body shall apply principles of auditor's rotation, which means that an auditor can only serve a maximum of period of three years continuous Bonsucre e red audits of one company. And that would then include all audits undertaken in that three year period. Well, this auditor uh, rotation will apply, of course, from now, from 2024 onwards. Um, this one, this change is a important one to, um, to understand, also for economic operators. Um, under Bonsucro EU Red, there are three categories of non-conformities, critical, major, and minor, where major non-conformities is, well, basically what is named systemic non-conformity in the certification protocol, and minor non-conformity is a conformity which is uh, specified as an incidental non-conformity in the Bonsucro certification protocol. The reason why uh, the terms major non-conformity and minor non-conformity are used in the Bonsucro ERAT standard is that this was an explicit requirement, again, from the European Commission. But as I said, it's a matter of terminology only and not um, uh, uh, different, basically, from systemic and incidental non-conformity as specified in the certification program. What is new is that um, also uh, the ERED standard uh, uh, specifies critical nonconformity. And a critical nonconformity is, as it reads here, the intentional violation of the Bonsucro ERED standard or any other Bonsucro standard, such as fraud, irreversible nonconformity, or a violation that jeopardizes the integrity of Bonsucro ERED. So it's a really, really heavy non-conformity, so to say. So it's a non-compliance with a mandatory requirement of the red recast. It's um, issues related to, to fraud, um, deliberate uh, classification uh, uh, as by gas of crops and residues. So really, really um, uh, fraud and irreversible um, non-conformities. So also important to re realize this aspect of critical non-conformity in Bonsucro only applies to the Bonsucro EU RED standard. 
What is also important in relation to this critical nonconformity is that there is a severe sanction on a um, critical nonconformity. In case a critical nonconformity has been identified, um, an economic operator uh, can only reapply for certification after a period of at least 12 months. It used to be in the previous version of the standard of the lapse of a fixed period of time determined by Bon Sucro, but this has been uh, made more strict. Now, also, again, a requirement from the European Commission. So reapply, reapplication for certification can only be done after at least 12 months. Um, yeah, then there is uh, additional requirements for the auditing of farms. Um, that's, that's very detailed and uh, very uh, large detailed uh, bit of text in uh, section 6.9 of the, of the standard, which basically relates to how groups of farms shall be audited, how samples uh, for audits uh, shall be uh, taken, what's, how the sample size shall be determined based on a risk assessment following a stepwise uh, approach very important for uh, certification bodies and for auditors to take a note of. Um, and those of you who are interested in the details, uh, please refer to this uh, section 6.9. Well, the same that there is um, requirements in relation to actual greenhouse gas emission uh, calculations, additional requirements for auditors, which basically say, uh, says that the, 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 the um, uh, that an auditor shall assess whether an economic operator actually has the capability, has the knowledge to perform actual calculations before that operator is allowed to use actual greenhouse gas calculations on its uh, transaction documentation. So, so to use it as evidence of uh, sustainability information. Um, then on the on the uh, issue of auditing of bagasse used for biomass fuels, as I mentioned previously, bagasse is considered a processing residue under EU rules. And the attractive uh, thing about being qualified as a processing residue is that for processing residues under EU RAT, only a very limited set of sustainability criteria apply, namely the greenhouse gas requirement chain of custody requirements, and in addition to that, the non-modification requirement. And that's the requirement which is important here on this slide. The non-modification requirement says that material shall not intentionally be modified or discarded to classify as a residue. This non-modification requirement finds its uh, history in, uh, let's say, cases whereby uh, 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 there was suspicion that uh, vegetable oils, in particular palm oil, was um, qualified as a residue, as a waste, as used cooking oil in particular, and so to, to well, to qualify as, as, a, as, a, as a processing residue, which would make it easier than to comply with EURAD sustainability uh, requirements. Well, in response to this uh, suspicions of fraudulent uh, cases, the Commission has included this non-modification requirement, and the auditor basically shall check that no other biomass streams or agricultural residues have, in the case of bagasse, have not intentionally been modified or discarded to be considered as a bagasse residue. So in other words, the, uh, the economic operator, they shall collect evidence which shows that uh, the, the quantity of bagasse which is being produced, if that bagasse is being used to produce biomass fuels, that the quantity of bagasse which is produced by the mill does not exceed, uh, let's say, industry average levels. Because if that were the case, if much more bagasse would be produced than you would expect, then there might be a suspicion that other biomass streams would have been mixed into the biomass fuels. 
other biomass streams which potentially are not processing residues and therefore would have to apply uh, would have to comply with more sustainability requirements. Well, this is then on the auditing of uh, back gas specifically. I will skip that uh, for now. And uh, finally, very briefly, the um, the auditor, the union database, we touched upon that earlier. Right? That this is an additional requirement that as soon as the union database is fully operational and its use is obligatory, economic operators shall use it and auditors doing their audits shall verify that indeed economic operators have uh, entered uh, relevant information in the union database and also that that information entered is correct. Then, um, there's also uh, additional requirements in the new version of the standard of what shall be uh, the, uh, contained in audit reports, summary audit reports and certificates. If you're interested to read that, this is all spelled out in Annex 4 of the Bonsuko E-RED standard, those requirements for the various reports and the certificates. Um, then, in addition to the uh, changes in the requirements for mills, for supply chain operators, for certification bodies and auditors. There's also a couple of changes in the new uh, Bonsucro sta red standard for Bonsucro as a scheme manager. And those requirements particularly uh, relate to uh, transparency. And basically it says that Bonsucro on its website uh, shall provide certain uh, certain pieces of information, for example, the status of all certificates and also an aggregated list of critical and major non-conformities. What I'd like to highlight with this second point is that is this is just an aggregated list. This is an anonymous list, so there will be no specific information on uh, non-conformities per operator. It will just be an aggregated anonymous overall list which will be published on the website then some final remarks to close off with uh, first about the implementation of this new version of the standard all the bon sucro eret audits since april 2024 which was the publication date of the new version of the standard all those audits shall be conducted against version 2.1 of the standard. Any certificates issued in compliance with EU Red Standard 1 before 8 of April remain valid until their expiration date. And also all Bon Sucro EU Red certified volumes in stock certified before the 8th of April will be considered sustainable. So this is important to take into account practically. Then, uh, finally, um, as you may have read in the um, Bon Sucro E-RED standard version 2.1, there is a reference to a so-called Bon Sucro E-RED low ILUC risk module. That is a separate um, a document uh, which sets out requirements for the certification of sugar canes against the EU requirements for low risk of indirect land use change. Uh, that document has been um, has been developed by Bonsucro approximately two two years ago. It has also been submitted in the past to the European Commission for assessment and formal approval. However, due to uh, capacity constraints um, to date, the European Commission nor their consultants haven't assessed this module yet. So basically, it's still in the pipeline. And as soon as the uh, assessment has been carried out by the European Commission and Bonsucro has received formal approval, then, uh, well, uh, Bonsucro will um, obviously notify you about this. Well, with this, I've come um, to the end of the of my uh, of my presentation uh, of the changes in the Bonsucro EU Red standard. 
Um, I mean, as, as you have heard over the past hour, it's a good few changes. Um, I hope that you also take away from my presentation that although there is many changes in the Monsecure ERAT standard, um, many of those changes, a significant part of those changes are relatively minor with, let's say, relatively minor impact in practical sense. Um, and as I said, um, please read the uh, the, the, the Sucre ERAT standard, the new version, to get a full overview of all details of the changes which have been made. For example, also the examples of changes in the mass balance calculation rules which have been included. With that, I'd like to finish and um, hand over to Paula to lead us to the uh, Q&A session.